Uh, our next speaker is John Aston, 40 years or so experience in the lighting industry, concentrating really on lighting controls. And uh, that is going to be uh, the topic of his talk. Please put your hands together for John. Thank you, Jeff. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'll try and be brief, although I'm not normally. <laughs> and uh, the clicker works great. OK, just uh, back to the old uh, public speaking school. Say what you're going to say, say it, tell them what you said, and pack up. So that's what I'm going to say. Uh, and it's quite difficult to say evolution and then revolution rather than revolution, but never mind. Um, I'm going to really go through how lighting controls have been determined to be able to, to, be able to deliver benefits, um, how they've responded to change in the lighting practice and lighting world and indeed in the technology. And what have we learned? I'm going to examine that quite closely because it's quite important and it has come up a little bit earlier. Peter mentioned certain things about scepticism about technology and things. So uh, I think you may some, find some of this familiar. And then look forward to see what we need to think about and what we need to beware of. Things like, you know, oh, just to pick up on Arnold's point, not using pulse width modulation at 400 hertz, for example, in dimming LEDs. So an introduction and a background and a bit of a history lesson. Well, before I put the first date on this page, um, actually lighting controls goes back to the uh, determination of light itself. Um, you actually extinguished your campfire by throwing sand or water all over it. So that was the first lighting control. You then burnt your fingers snuffing out the uh, wick of your oil lamp, or you got more sophisticated and got a candle snuffer. Um, and then along came uh, the energy crisis uh, and electricity and all those sort of things. And I, I sort of think the mid-70s are when we started with lighting controls, really, uh, when people began to realise that it actually cost money to run their lighting. These were the days where people thought you could switch on a fluorescent light, leave it on for its life, uh, in case it used more energy when you started it up and stopped it. Um, in the mid-80s, we suddenly redesigned the lighting controls so that they could be integrated into new buildings rather than retrofitted into old ones and discovered that we could actually reduce the cost of installation, and I'll show you that a bit later. Then flexibility, you know, these new office spaces, they needed to change, they needed to react to business uh, demands and, and the changes of the way we work, so that was uh, a new benefit. By the 1990s, I would suggest that most offices with a floor area in excess of 20,000 square feet would probably have included some form of lighting control system. And then from the year 2000 onwards, we started hearing about circadian lighting and biodynamics and these sort of things, uh, and lighting controls got embroiled in the comfort, health and well-being, not to mention also uh, a larger involvement in safety in producing means to test emergency lighting and to monitor it more successfully than had previously been the case. Mid-twenties, or O5s, or the noughties, the mid-noughties, I suppose we call this, really, isn't it? Um, Solid-state lighting has introduced a whole new set of control regimes and control opportunities. After all, an LED is an instant light, and certainly, unlike the projector above, does not need time to warm up. Uh, and then 2015, delivering complete lighting solutions. So the lighting controls and the lighting work together to such an extent that you really can't do one without the other. Uh, and energy actually has come back on the agenda a bit. People are beginning to look at paybacks again, surprisingly. Today, a lighting control system offers more than just functionality, or more functionality than ever before, but we can't always use it all. And in the future, we're hearing a lot about it delivering big data. More of that later. So what about these benefits? Well, there they all are summated there, and I'll skip through that quickly. Energy saving, initially we did it by switching. And those of you who are old enough to remember might recall something called the ECS reset switch. 
It was a pull cord attached to a lot of the light fittings within an office space, and it very successfully reduced lighting electricity costs by 50, 60, even 75% in some instances. It made the whole lighting industry begin to query, were we right to concentrate on uniform lighting, or was a non-uniform lighting scheme uh, preferred by the users? Um, and it was a very simple way of doing things. But uh, it related the switch to the light. So there's your individual occupancy detector, I suppose you could call it, because if you didn't get to the light, you couldn't turn it on. Uh, whereas previously, an individual switch, that's fine, on, off, it works. Put them all together like that, and actually, you don't know which switch controls which light, so you put them all on anyway uh, to make sure you switched your light on. But this way, you didn't. And then we could introduce some time control, which was great because it was analog and you knew when the events were going to occur, um, which is a bit different from some of the later machines. And then the true occupancy sensor also came along around those times. But then, of course, there's a great deal more opportunity to save lighting and electricity costs by dimming, because as earlier speakers have all explained, we all have individual eyes, so quite a lot of us actually don't want the 500 lux that's been provided. We'll quite happily dim our local lighting to 200 or even 150, I've seen. And I know one client who, whose facilities manager actually set luminaires at the request of certain individuals to 20% of their capable output. Oh, the joys of youth. <laughs> um, and of course, daylight uh, dimming demonstrated here in our office, 51% average over the year. And you can see how it works better at the summer than it does in the winter. Quite logical, quite sensible. And uh, just think what you could do if you added occupancy detection to that as well. And also it's more sophisticated. You could actually integrate your daylight with the uh, artificial lighting control. So. Energy saving, we've got that done and dusted, we can do that. Installation costs. Now, I'm not going to try and ask you to read that costing, which is a detailed costing prepared by a QS um, of great repute. <coughs> he worked out in an installation of just 138 luminaires that by using a plug-in box, a forebear of this rather more complicated one, you could reduce the installation costs by 27%. We had customers who bought lighting controls when they weren't on the specification to give themselves a competitive installation advantage. And that low cost of installation meant that it was also flexible because all the switch connections were low voltage or extra low voltage, didn't always actually need an electrician to do it. <laughs> Controversial. Anyway, this particular office, they anticipated 600 changes per annum. What actually happened? 3,000. In addition, it delivered comfort because you've got more individual lighting control. The users were able to do it. And one of the ways you can get more individual lighting control is to get like-minded people together, or like-sighted people together, maybe. And it reduced the energy consumption at the same time. And we'll come on to that a little bit later as well. Then came comfort, health and well-being. And we've seen a bit of this. Mike showed an equivalent of this this morning. Um, how daylight changes, how our circadian rhythms change. And the idea that we're looking for something better in terms of how we light the interior environment um, without just simply dimming it and simply accepting that there's just one colour of good light. Lighting controls also help with compliance. Approved document L for the building regulations. Actually, it's quite hard to design a building without putting lighting controls in to get your predicted energy savings. But lighting controls have a role to play in health and safety regulation as well because lighting controls can provide comprehensive monitoring and testing of lighting emergency systems or emergency lighting systems rather. Uh, and that's required by health and safety, and that's actually the only area where you can land up in jail if you get it wrong. Um, and then, of course, there's EN12464 and all our wonderful SLL guides, which lighting controls help you deliver the lighting schemes that these documents recommend 
or regulate. Reduce maintenance cost. It's not physically saying it's cheaper to change your lights or anything like that, but it does mean your maintenance programs can be much more targeted, much more tuned to what's happening. And actually, one client, when he was talking about controls and lamp changes in the days when we had lamp changes in fluorescent terms, um, we worked out that they could do lamp changes every four years in the offices where the average use of the luminaires by the windows were less than 2,000 hours a year. Uh, and in the corridors, they did this standard two-year cycle. So it did reduce the costs. And by being careful with the frequency of switching, you didn't compromise the lamp life. And of course, this was all supported by research, and you wondered if I could get an LR&T reference into this. Well, I have, um, and this is the only time I got my name in LR&T, uh, because Carter, Slater, and Moore did three comprehensive studies of 14 buildings containing lighting control systems. Now, uh, I'll just show you the three different studies quickly. But in summary, they concluded that actually people preferred having control over their lighting, it's a psychological thing. They like to be able to control part of their environment, and they know damn well they can't change the heating or the air conditioning, but at least they can alter the lighting. <coughs> and those offices that had the most manual controls, i.e. The, 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 the highest ratio between controls and lights, so if there was one control per light, the better, the less energy they used. Gosh, comfortable offices using less energy. What more could we want? Well, the research showed the controls work, but the photographs might question that. Why? Well, this is one of those buildings on that particular site um, who were protesting that they were using too much energy, but they were arguing about the baseline that we were suggesting was their current cost of energy. And it wasn't until we got the half-hourly figures from their main meters and integrated the three meters and you can see they had a four and a half MVA supply here that we discovered that the lighting which was about 1.1 megawatts of installed lighting load was part of their 24 7 base load why you ask was the lighting or was the power going up and down during the day well that was the 8,000 staff arriving turning on their computers And that building has a full lighting management system. The problem is, nobody knows how to work it. <laughs> and then when you do put controls in, I mean, look at the one on the left. East side lighting override. Push button, hold for five seconds, release and wait for 90 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and if after 90 seconds, did I press it for five seconds or not? Um, is my watch right? Um, what about this next one? Well, we saw that plate before, but did you notice the little sign on the top? 415 volts. That's helpful. Or what about this one? Um, what on earth is that? And what do I do? And actually, then there's a central controller that manages all this. But where's the manual? Well, where's the manual? Regulation, building regulations 40. And this is actually a building regulation. It's not one of the approved documents. Let me show you that paragraph. You must hand over sufficient information within five days of handing over your building, sufficient information to run that building in the optimal energy mode. That suggests to me that every time you give somebody a building, you A, commission it, and B, give them a full operating manual. I went to a modern site on Heathrow, sort of on a spying exercise, because I knew a competitor system was in there. And I was given access to the operating manual's room. And I got the big lighting manual down. And I leafed through to get to the lighting control system, passed all sorts of detailed drawings of luminaires and everything else, and I got to a page that said lighting controls. And I turned the page. There are no user serviceable parts in this system. Please refer to the manufacturer, who doesn't exist anymore. How did they get away with that? 
So, I like putting quotes in my... This is often ascribed to Winston Churchill, but that's the true origin of those who cannot remember the past condemned to repeat it. So, what is it we want our lights and controls to do? Well, we want it to provide high-quality illumination, comfortable and safe working environment. It should be, you know, adding to the building, adding to the experience. It shouldn't be a, something to leap over, something that gets in the way of a good building. So you actually need to look at what you need for your lighting controls. And I thank a member of this audience, I think, who did this mind map, because I don't do mind maps. But actually analysing what you need out of a lighting control system is a jolly good idea and a jolly good starting place to work from. Now, this shows you all the options you could possibly think of. You might not need all of them. Um, but you need to look at how you're going to control your lighting, how the building's going to behave, and how the lighting will accept those controls. And you don't want to then develop a specification which is built on the features page in the brochure. I mean, excuse me, who wants features? You want functionality and you want performance. So you devise, devise a specification which tells the installer and the designer and, and, and the people who are supplying the equipment how this building is going to work and how users will get on with it. But unfortunately, lighting is the most pervasive service in a building. This was recognised in the Lloyd's 1986 building when we installed a computer-based lighting management system which was also asked to look after the fan air recirculation terminals which has the best acronym you've ever heard think about it <laughs> and the heat pumps because they knew the controls had to go everywhere the BMS didn't there were just six relays between the BMS and the lighting management system because it's the most pervasive thing, people are looking at it as the infrastructure for gathering big data in buildings. So lighting and controls are now seen as something that smart buildings need, and it might be you know, not what we first thought of. We've got a whole new lexicon of words. I won't read them all on there, but I will draw your attention to one. Data analytics, has that been in the news lately? <laughs> Ethics. Uh, <laughs> Li-Fi, that's a new one. Communicating by light. But the bottom line one, this one, this is what people are looking at. Occupancy analytics in commercial office space. 4.6 billion by 2022. Sudden different market driver. So the reasons we had lighting controls are sort of two reasons. There were standard or type lighting control systems. We had standalone and self-managed luminaires. The ones they used to call intelligent but never were. Um, and lighting control systems. I'm not going to read it all through, and I know we're tight for time today, but now, with the idea of gathering data, location-based services, smart apps, all these sort of things, we need to be careful. We need to think before we leap and do all these things. We need to understand what it does. And this really sort of just emphasizes the previous slide. Um, I won't leave it there for too long. Can it be done? It can. This building in Amsterdam called The Edge has got a complete power over Ethernet lighting system. The fact that you can supply LEDs with DC voltages means it's easy to do, and it means that you can start integrating the whole lighting infrastructure into your IT infrastructure. And suddenly you're actually perhaps having to convince IT professionals rather than building services professionals what your system might be able to do. And I remember the days when we had our early computer-based systems and people said, well, what about some online support? And this is in the late 90s. And we used to say, well, if you can put PC Anywhere on your computer, and IT professionals were sort of shrieking from, from the room because PC Anywhere was the sort of thing that people used to take control of other people's computers. Not good practice, uh, particularly if it was on the network. But this is potentially the future, and it's potentially uh, beneficial. So long as we remember what we've learned about lighting controls, how they're made easy to use. Now, this looks useful, um, but it depends who the user is. Here's an app <coughs> for controlling the lighting, but if that app is about to control all the lights you can see in the background, and Arnold probably wouldn't like that anyway, um, then it's probably the wrong controller. But if that is actually going to program each individual light to do what it's supposed to do, then it might be a good app. But I like this app. 
because it actually shows you what you're looking at and you can touch on the uh, items that you want to control. If we can do more of that, then perhaps we're beginning to understand that user controls can be designed effectively. And we can then develop a, a whole ethos for smart cities, how maybe shop fronts replace street lights in a way. Maybe those queues in big cities where you've got large video walls, you accept that that's the lighting until those video walls are turned off and then you change over to other lighting. You integrate uh, more successfully. But the Internet of Things, is this the platform to put it on? Well, uh, I asked Ray Maloney if I could use the Lux thing because he had a headline, Euro Data Laws Rewrite Rules of IoT Lighting. Or, my lighting knows where you are. Lock up your data and get consent. And you might have new things. Plumbers recruited to fight cybercrime. Because actually mechanical plant is using <coughs> IoT already. Hackers have access to 20 million British devices through CCTV cameras. Or even this one, hotel rooms, through picking up rejected, out-of-date hotel reader cards. Somebody worked out how to hack most of the hotel rooms in Europe. Cyber security is going to be a serious problem. So what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> well, that's a photograph my son took and tweeted, not realising that, or forgetting, his father was a lighting geek. I, that's a, an award-winning design building. It used to be the Prudential building. Oh, I hope my arm's upset anyway. The lighting management system has allowed it to go down to two lights with no background lighting. Campfire in a, cannon, a, campfire in a, ca a cave? Wow. Not good. Or maybe how smart do you want your meters and your systems to be? That's a hell of a big house because <laughs> that's a domestic meter. So, uh, yeah, another little quote. History may repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. Ascribed to Mark Twain, one of your country folk, I believe. So, just to conclude, you thought I'd never finish, I'm going to. Um, writing in the built environment, it's too important to mess it up. We've got a lot of technology, and we've got a lot of ability to make it really effective and really beneficial. But we've also got a lot of ability, by omission, by lack of control of the building construction process, to let it go horribly wrong. So uh, let me leave you with those thoughts. And in the meantime, the lights are still on after hours. Thank you very much for your attention.